from lovely Maple Grove, Minnesota and SixFootMama.com. This is Still Growing with Jennifer Ebling. Still Growing is a gardening podcast dedicated to helping you and your garden grow. Hi there, everyone, and welcome to Still Growing, and thank you for listening. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling. Lisa Eldred Steinkopf is on the show, also known as the houseplant guru. And guess what we're talking about? Ding, ding, ding. You're right. Her new book on houseplants by Cool Springs Press, and it's called Houseplants, The Complete Guide to Choosing, Growing, and Caring for Indoor Houseplants. In September of last year, the Washington Post wrote an article about the resurgent interest in houseplants, and it was called Millennials Are Filling Their Homes and the Void in Their Hearts with Houseplants. Those smart millennials. Now, if you, like so many millennials, are filling your house with houseplants, you'll love today's chat with Lisa. One of the things I appreciated the most about Lisa's book is that she divided the 125 houseplants featured in her book into three helpful categories. There's easy to grow, moderately easy to grow, and don't try this at home. It's a waste of money and time, and you really need that new pair of shoes. (laughs) Just kidding. It's actually called challenging to grow, which actually doesn't sound so bad now that I ruined it, does it? But still, you've got to be careful with those guys. Now, guess which one we spent the most time talking about? You're right again, the easy to grow category, because that's where the sweet spot is. These are the plants that are the best investment of your time and money, and the plants that will give you the most personal satisfaction. Here's what you're going to love about Lisa. She's totally down to earth, and she's a conscious competent. She knows what she knows, and she can tell us all about it. I'm betting that she must be an incredibly wonderful mom and wife because her understanding family has made room for over a thousand houseplants in their home, and they're thriving under Lisa's care and supervision. Bonus for us, Lisa can talk about houseplants all the the live long day. And she told me so at the end of our episode. And it is so nice to talk gardening with fellow garden geeks, isn't it? Easy to grow houseplants with Lisa Eldred Steinkopf. That's the topic of today's show. And it's coming up after an update on the listener community for the show and this week's Garden News Roundup. All right, let's kick things off. I'll start by saying thank you for listening to the podcast this week. If you're new and you just found the show, I want to give you a special welcome today. Thank you for being here. And if you're a returning listener, welcome. Glad you're back. And, you know, I like to say, I hope you're listening to many gardening podcasts because that's how you'll have a variety of gardening podcasts to listen to. So if you're looking for that, please make sure that you support your gardening podcasts Every now and then, go up into the search bar of whatever you're listening to podcasts on, whatever player, whether it's Stitcher or Overcast or TuneIn or the Apple Podcasts app or Google Play, and make sure from time to time you type in gardening into the search bar and see what pops up and do a little bit of exploring in this subject area. You know, this past week, I listened to Joe Lample's podcast series on Gardening Myths Busted, and that was featuring guest Professor Linda Chalker Scott. And I think it's excellent continuing ed for all gardeners. It was a three-part series, so three hours of great information, and that's over on the Joe Gardner podcast. You won't regret it. I learned so much from those three episodes, and I know you will too. 
In any case, I think that podcasts are such a wonderful way to grow and learn as a gardener the entire year long. So I hope that you're doing that. I hope that you're finding some new shows. And if you discover one that I haven't mentioned, make sure you share it in the listener community. And no matter what else you're listening to, Just remember that I'm very honored that you're spending some of your listening time here listening to the Still Growing Podcast, so thank you for that. I'd also like to make sure that you know about the listener community in the free Facebook group. It's called the Still Growing Podcast Group. If you've been listening to the show for some time and you just haven't gotten around to joining, please go ahead and do that this week. I'd love to meet you in the group. And if you're a first-time listener, all you have to do to find our free Facebook group is when you're in Facebook, go up to the search bar and type in Still Growing Podcast Group and then request to join. You'll get all of the information, all of the articles that I share in the Garden News Roundup, plus bonus content. And the Facebook group is the only place that I will go to pick lucky listeners for any giveaways. And last week's episode on How to Speak Chicken, there was a giveaway for Melissa Coffey's book, How to Speak Chicken. And the winner from our Facebook group, the Still Growing Podcast group, is Sue Luftig. So congratulations, Sue. I know you're thrilled about it because you have chickens. So I know that you'll really enjoy Melissa's book. So congratulations, Sue. You know, the other reason that I think is great to join the group is that you get a chance to interact with the guests that have been on the show. I would say that over the course of the past couple of years, about 90% of the guests that have been on the show have joined the group. Now, what's great about that for you is that if you have a follow-up question or a question about something and we've touched on it in a previous episode, you have access to these subject matter experts. And that's just tremendous. They're very willing to share their expertise and time with listeners in the group. So definitely take advantage of that. All right. So while we're at it, let me take a second to welcome new members into the group. Marin Wynn, Bob Leisure, Jane Spooner, Daria Murphy, Tommy Ryan, Kathy Smith, Lisa Lane, Nancy Andrews, Carol Baxter Lynn, Rachel Lemke, Dan Eggert, and Robin Arland Ball. Welcome, you guys. Well, in the listener community this week, we've had an informal poll going about what is your favorite houseplant, and the overwhelming winner is succulents, followed by orchids. And then, of course, people couldn't resist sharing pictures of their beautiful orchids and succulents, so that was bonus. And then I stumbled on this really adorable picture that was shared by Mr. Plant Geek, Michael Perry, and it was of these miniature flower globes. So imagine a globe, and instead of the globe, you put a ball that's surrounded by these flowers. Just adorable. Mr. Plant Geek shared it on Twitter. I shared it in the group. They are way too cute. So if you get a chance to check those out, just type in geek and this post will pop right up. Well, there's a phone number you can call for the show if you have any questions or suggestions or feedback. You can always call 865-333-GROW or 865-333-4769. I love hearing your voices. All right, now it's time for the Garden News Roundup. This is a curated group of posts and articles that I've shared over the past week with the listener community in the free Facebook group, the Still Growing Podcast Group. And it's made up of a dozen different segments. Now, what's great about this for you is that you get to stay pretty informed about what's going on in horticulture and gardening just by listening to this part of the show each week. And you can easily check out these curated articles and posts for yourself because I share all of it with the listener community in the free Facebook group, the Still Growing Podcast Group. So if you hear something and you want to read the full article, there's no need to take notes or track down links. Just head on over to the group and join. In the guest update segment, upcoming guest of the Still Growing Podcast, Jessica Walliser, wrote this great post about leaf-footed bugs and how to manage them. 
They've been more of a problem in southern parts of the country, but they're creeping north. So that was a great post. And then blogger Diana Stoll, who's been on the podcast before reading some of her poetry, shared this really magnificent post about a friend who managed to scrap together leftover materials and old windows and bricks and many discarded items and put together her own amazing greenhouse. And you have to see it. It's just beautiful. The whole bottom area, the bottom third of it is this brick that she rescued from going to the dump. And then these beautiful windows. This woman named Marcy, Diana's friend, just happened to be passing by a house that was having its windows replaced. And she was able to secure all of those windows, bring them home, and wait for the right time to put her greenhouse together. And this post is by Diana is called The Greenhouse That Marcy Built. It's a charming post. It's loaded with pictures. And if you've been toying with the idea of getting a greenhouse for yourself, or you just enjoy looking at those things, I do, you've got to check this post out. Great pictures, Great words written by Diana Stoll. In sustainability this week, there was this really fun lesson that was shared in Plew's Garden Design out of England. And it's about this practice of forcing rhubarb, which apparently is so common over in England. And when I shared this in the group, it was just fantastic. It got great response. I said, to the haters who didn't think forcing rhubarb was a thing, I know many of my fellow Minnesotan gardeners had no idea about forcing rhubarb. It's never crossed our minds. And then listener Patricia Chandler Newport shared this great video of folks who are in a greenhouse in England and they're listening to the rhubarb in this greenhouse because you can actually hear the rhubarb growing. So that was just an outstandingly cool clip from Patricia. And if you get a chance, you've got to check that out. Just type in rhubarb in the Still Growing Podcast group and that post will pop right up and you can watch that video and listen to rhubarb growing for yourself. And if you're curious... It sounds like cracking. It sounds like wood cracking. That's what I equated it to. In continuing, Ed, there is a post that I shared about the best blogs for Zone 4 gardening. A few of them I've heard of. A few were new to me. There's one that's called Alaska Urban Hippie. Salt in My Coffee, love that name. Walkerland and North Country Farmer. So if you get a chance, check those blogs out. There'll be links to them in the show notes for this episode. In the How To DIY segment, upcoming guest Jessica Wallacer, who writes prolifically for the gardening community on so many different platforms, shared this really wonderful post, Identifying and Controlling Tomato Plant Diseases. So check out this post. It's a great post, helping you identify and control tomato plant diseases. Another post in the How To DIY segment that was shared in the group is something I found that's called How To Make Seed Starters From Your Bathroom's Loofah. It's apparently a decent option. You can take these loofah sections and then use them as a medium to start your seeds in. And I talk about growing loofah, these loofah gourds, in an upcoming episode with Wendy Kyung Spray of the Chinese Kitchen Garden. And you guys are going to love that episode. So Wendy weighed in here on how to successfully grow loofah. So if you're interested in that, just type in loofah. L-U-F-F-A in the search bar over in the listener community, and this post will pop up. In the plant spotlight, there were two posts that caught my eye on Twitter this week. The first was shared by Monrovia, and they were sharing a post about fruity, fragrant conifers. These are conifers that are easy, tough, very hardy that also have distinctly fruity scents. And they shared five of them to consider. That was a great post. When I shared it on Twitter, I said, conifer smell fruity? 
Yes, it can. But um bum. The other post that I found had to do with a plant that's debuting from Thompson and Morgan out of England. It's not available in the United States, but it is just adorable. And it's a new dwarf sunflower called Sun Believable. It's just sweet as pie. So if you're in England or you have access to that seed, check that post out. In the news, there are a ton of posts starting to circulate about the Philadelphia Flower Show this year. It's going to be tremendous. It has a water theme. And as I was reading about it and seeing all of these pictures of these gorgeous vignettes that they're creating, and they even have this magnificent rope bridge so you can go over the top of some of these and and get a bird's eye view of the entire exhibit. I have to say what I was most intrigued by, what got me the most excited is the fact that visitors to the show this year will be able to make some jewelry. They'll be able to make a little pendant. There'll be a little vial that they can create a living water garden out of, and it will actually have a living moss ball in it. So when I shared this in the group, I said, I love the rope bridge but I really want the little water garden pendant because I love jewelry. So if you get to go to that and you get that pendant, I want to see a picture of it and I want to see how fantastic it looks. They were showing pictures of it, but you never know. These are media pictures and it looks fantastic. It would be totally worth it for me to go to the Philadelphia Flower Show if it was closer. I'd definitely be first in line to get one of those pendants. Doesn't that sound cool? Then another post out of England caught my eye for the news segment, and it has to do with the hedgehog's demise in British gardens and in the countryside. Apparently, they have a declining population. That's a concern because the humble hedgehog was crowned Britain's national species and Britain's favorite mammal. So they definitely don't want the hedgehog to go away. They're so cute. But the advice in this article is if you want to create habitat for hedgehogs, You've got to kind of hold off on the cleanup. Things like log piles, compost heaps, leaf piles, overgrown corners, wildflower patches, all of that is attractive to hedgehogs. That's natural habitat. So keep that in mind if you're in England and you want to try to help save the hedgehog. In the Dream Guest segment this week, there's a post I shared a while ago. I just haven't had a chance to share it here on the show. And it has to do with a lifelong collection that was featured by a gentleman named John Landy. And he created a private butterfly collection that's one of the largest in Australia. Just absolutely stunning. And he shared all of these behind-the-scenes stories of what it was like to hunt for butterflies when he was young in the early to mid-1900s. And then, of course, his own thoughts on the declining butterfly population. But his collection is amazing. And that's why John Landy made the Dream Guest segment this week. In Science, the Washington Post shared an article that shows the bias that can exist in science. And the example that they used had to do with bees, because apparently for thousands of years, scientists thought that hives were led by kings instead of queens. As recently as the 1700s, that information was being distributed. And they gave a few other examples as well, including thoughts from Aristotle with strong male bias, of course. And it was just very interesting to read. Also in science was a great post that I found, and it was shared by froglife.org. They're great to follow on social media as well, especially if you're into frogs. And the whole point of this article is talking about the territorial behavior, not only in frogs, but also in salamanders. So that's why if you've got a frog or certain frogs that have taken up residence in your garden, You're not going to see this huge influx of other frogs coming in because they're so territorial. They defend their home range. And that territory in this article, it said it can be as much as 13 meters squared. In fact, if you take males out of their environment in this research that they did, they took them 200 meters out of their territory. 
80% successfully came back. And when they took them 400 meters away from their home site, 30% came back to defend it. So these guys, frogs and salamanders, they have excellent spatial awareness and they go back to their territory even after they're moved outside of their home range. Just fascinating, isn't it? In shopping this week, London Plantology wrote a great post, and it was called Seeds to Sow in January. And I love how this post starts out. They wrote, over the last two weeks, many fellow garden bloggers wrote about their almost uncontrollable desire to start sowing seeds in January. And Isn't this the truth? Because if you're a gardener, you probably are in a lot of gardening groups. You see a lot of gardening posts. And I can't tell you the number of posts I have read really since after Christmas all about seed starting. People are super eager. Now, what I liked about this post from London Plantology is that they give you a whole gamut of seeds and ideas for seed starting. You have snapdragons and sweet peas, but you also have things like the pitcher plant and ornamentals. Not only that, also salad greens on the windowsill. So this was a favorite post of mine this past month. In recipes, I stumbled on this cute post. It was from Botanical Arts Press, and it was called Mayonnaise Master Recipe and All Its Herbal Variations. This post was appealing to me because I like to make my own different mayonnaise blends. And the author gave a number of different recipes and blends that you can try at home. So just a lot of good ideas for herbal mayonnaise, compounds. There was a bergamot mayo, a thyme mayo, a sweet Sicily mayo. I thought that sounded great. Allium, of course. Anyway, lots of great ideas with full recipes in that post. In inspiration this week, the English Garden shared this great post. It was talking about the medieval garden style. It said, discover the elements, features, plants, and design of medieval gardens. The symbolic planting and use of gardens in the medieval era was a powerful metaphor for paradise as well as the divine. And that was great. That's what led me to look at the article. But what really blew me away is that there is a twig bench, a willow seat. It's made out of willow, and it has three levels to it. So it not only has a back and a seat that's made out of these willow branches, but also the base of it, the floor of it, is also made of these willow branches. It's just phenomenal. It's so captivating. You've got to check it out. So if you get over to the Facebook group, just type in medieval And this post will pop right up, but you're really checking it out for this amazing bench. Finally, an inspiration. I think I saved the best to last. There was a photo that really blew people's mind. It is a photo from Jamie Rojo. He witnessed this spectacular gathering of monarch butterflies. He, he actually had been to Mexico and had seen it before. But this time, when he went in 2017, he had a permit to remain until dusk. So he had to, he he said when he took this picture, and you, you've got to see it, it's just amazing. He actually had to run uphill. He was chasing the light the entire time, trying to get pictures of these monarchs as they're roosting in these trees and these conifers. And it's just incredible. The, the trees are covered. Not only are the branches covered, but the trunks are covered. So the trees are are positively golden. The sun is setting, shining on this scenery that's completely covered in monarchs. And folks in the listener community were just completely astounded. I mean, this really is a jaw-dropping picture. So that's why it's in the inspiration segment this week. So you got to check that out. If you're in the Facebook group, just search for Monarch. We've had a number of posts, but that's the most recent one, and that will pop right up. All right, in quotables this week, I found a few quotes about container or indoor gardening, about houseplants, things of that nature. So I thought I'd share those with you for the quotables segment for this episode. This first one is from John Van de Water. Plants in pots are like animals in a zoo. They're totally dependent on their keepers. 
In October, November of 1988, this was the quote from the Herb Companion. The last Friday in July is Take Your Houseplants for a Walk Day. This next one is from Catherine White from Onward and Upward in the Garden from 1958. For the most part, I raise only the commonest, easiest plants and flowering bulbs. Once in a while, I take a flyer and try a difficult exotic. Orchids I abjure entirely for lack of time, but even with this modest program, I become in winter a sort of floor nurse in my spare moments, taking temperatures, rubbing backs, and making a thousand small adjustments when my patients summon me. Isn't that great? Hey, and by the way, in that past quote, if you didn't know what the word abjure meant, it means to renounce or reject. So when she said, orchids, I abjure entirely for lack of time, she wasn't going to get on the orchid bandwagon because she just didn't have the time to take care of them. Here's a great one from Francis Tenenbaum. He wrote this in Taylor's Guide to Houseplants in 1987. Remember that your plants don't need you as much as you may think they do. Here's a good one from Henry Mitchell. And these house plants are much like the Vietnam War. Once you have invested enough labor and woe, you are strangely unwilling to acknowledge that it was a stupid mistake to begin with. You just go on and on. (laughs) Like that one. Here's one from Michael Fox, featured in Grandmother and Her Peonies from My Favorite Plant by Jamaica Kincaid in 1998. A nursery plant comes from parent stock in the same way as the slip or division I've acquired from a friend or neighbor with only this difference. It has spent its life in a plastic pot moving here and there on a truck bed, living on Peters and Progro. I pity and want to console nursery plants for their hothouse tenderness, their lack of heritage, their lack of ground. Here's a good one from Phil Tactile on the challenges of growing bonsai indoors. This was featured in the New York Times December 29th, 1990. Keep in mind that the average home is 5% drier than the Sahara Desert, has almost no air movement, and usually poor light. These are hardly ideal conditions for plants. Finally, this one from Josephine Saxton, Gardening Down a Rabbit Hole from 1996. Stop bothering with houseplants unless you have absolutely no earth of your own outside. Two houseplants in one house are plenty. You will need all the windowsills for cuttings and trays of seeds. Well, I know Lisa and I would disagree with that, but that's all right. To each his own. Well, that's the Garden News Roundup for this week's show. Just a reminder, you can get all of these posts with links and bonus content in your Facebook feed if you join the listener community in the free Facebook group, the Still Growing Podcast Group. I'd love to meet you in the group. With that, let's transition to the topic of today's show, Easy to Grow Houseplants with Lisa Eldred Steinkopf. I had learned about Lisa's new book, Houseplants, The Complete Guide to Choosing, Growing, and Caring for Indoor Plants when it first came out. But it wasn't until I heard Lisa's interview on episode 312 of the Vegetable Gardening Show podcast with host Mike Podlesny that I knew I wanted to talk to her. In about three minutes of listening to that show, it was super clear to me that Lisa is wonderfully practical and conversational. And that's the kind of person you want to talk to about houseplants. So I tracked her down. Lisa is known as the houseplant guru, 
always eager to learn more. She's a member of an African Violet Club and the Michigan Cactus and Succulent Society. Now, Lisa grows an enormous amount of wonderful houseplants in her Michigan suburban home. They're on windowsills. They're in the kitchen. They're tucked in little clusters in every single room. They're under electric lights. Well, you get the point. Yet, this little factoid caught my attention. Lisa also has many prized legacy plants from her great-grandmother and other relatives, and they've managed to survive. They've stood the test of time, and they would totally qualify as antiques. They are many, many, many decades old. And this love of propagating and sharing and passing on houseplants Yeah, that's something the women in Lisa's family grew up knowing how to do. Now that is super cool. Now, let me just make sure to mention that today's show is what I call a feel-good episode, meaning you're going to feel a whole lot better about your houseplant failures and successes after listening to Lisa today. Lisa and I talk all kinds of houseplant advice, her thoughts on lighting, watering, pests, fertilizer, temperature, and did I mention lighting? Yeah, that one is so important, and you're about to find out. So star that one in your mind so you can access it in that ever-growing garden library you're building in your brain. As I mentioned at the top of the show, Lisa's book covers how to properly care for houseplants in detail. But I was also very delighted to see how Lisa divvied up the 125 houseplants that are featured in individual profiles in her book. And you get to see a lot of pictures of her actual plants. She put these guys into three helpful categories, easy to grow, moderately easy to grow, and challenging to grow. That's the category we need to just admire in the store and just keep on walking. Right. Anyway, we're going to spend the most time chatting about the plants that fall into that easy to grow category because that's really where the sweet spot is. These are the plants that are the best investment of your time and your money. And they're the plants that will give you the most personal satisfaction. Now, before we get going, I thought I'd share a little excerpt from the introduction to Lisa's new book. It'll give you an idea of Lisa's easygoing, down-to-earth manner and her abiding love for houseplants. Here we go. We all have the need to nurture and care for other living things. Maybe you aren't ready for a cat, dog, or fish, but bringing home a houseplant can fulfill that need. Place a plant on the windowsill, and it will add living beauty to your home. Wake up every day, and it will greet you as it cleans the air and improves your mood. Houseplants really ask for so little but add so much life to a home. The care of that green friend, I love that, falls solely on the owner. Yet having a green thumb is just a matter of paying attention to the needs of your plants and noticing when they're trying to tell you something. This book will show you how to do that. Well, amen to all of that, right? To borrow a line from Norman Vincent Peale, let's figure out how to make some green friends and influence them. It's time to get house planting with the houseplant guru, the woman with over a thousand houseplants in the home she shares with her very understanding hubby, John. Aren't all the good guys named John? That's my boy. Michigan's own Lisa Eldred Steinkopf. Well, Lisa, welcome to the Still Growing Podcast. Thank you for having me, Jennifer. I'm so excited to talk about houseplants. <laughs> I, I love it. I had to chuckle a little bit. I thought, you know what? We're going to start this interview out, and I'm going to channel 
a little Julie Andrews from The Sound of Music. We're going to start at the very beginning. And I noticed in your acknowledgments that you recognized your grandma, Eleanor Eldred, who really instilled in you your love of house plants. I lived out in the middle of nowhere near Mount Pleasant, Michigan, middle, you know, middle of the mitten, middle, you know, I could show you on my hand. And, um, she just lived like a half a mile from us on a big farm. And I would go over there, ride my bike over there. And she had the most beautiful African violets in her kitchen window. And I have pictures of those still. And she grew amaryllis and ferns. I still have one of her ferns. And she just had the most beautiful house plants. She was always starting new ones. And I just, I just loved them. So when people say that, you know, African violets are their grandma plant, that doesn't bother me because it brings back such good memories. And they're really not grandma plants anymore. <laughs> they're definitely not grandma plants anymore. They're very, very in vogue again. What are your tips and tricks for taking care of African violets as long as we're on the topic? Well, I will tell you, I'm a member of an African violet society here in Michigan. And some of these people have the most beautiful setup. It, actually, the picture in the book, the light uh, garden that I that's in my book is a where we meet in that room for African Violet meeting, and it's just so beautiful. And I think I did better with them before I knew so much about them. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm really, a couple of us have said that, like we did better with our violets before we joined us because now we know too much and we're trying too hard to follow their <laughs> recipes and, and what they do and how they do it. But, um, it, you know, you need them. It's all about light. If they're not blooming, you know, fertilizer is not going to help. Um, more water is not going to help, less water. It's all about the light. And they love an east window if you have, you know, if you just want to grow in your windows. But I grow mine under lights, and they're on about 12 hours a day. Oh, the lights are on about 12 hours a day. Yes. Okay, so that's get, more than I would have imagined. Yes, because they, you know, they want that half dark, half light, because they kind of grow near the equator. So it's kind of always 12 hours light, 12 hours dark, and then they bloom beautifully for me. And the thing is, is that people also don't understand, you know, they come to me with those really long necks, we call them, where this, you know, they get really long and, and naked on the bottom. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Gotta, you just got to scrape that neck to get all that brown, crusty stuff off and then sink them into the soil, cut the bottom, the bottom off, the bottom of the root ball. As much neck as you have, you're going to cut that much root ball off and then, you know, bury, bury that neck in soil or meat potting medium. And it will grow new roots. Then you won't have the neck anymore. Well, there you go. Yeah, I always yeah. hate because then they start to look a little leggy and yeah. not as attractive. And I think intuitively I was doing that. I was burying them, but I wasn't cutting the root ball off the bottom. Yeah, because they really never need more unless you're growing them for show and you have this enormous violet. Really, they never need to be in a pot bigger than the one they came in, a four-inch azalea pot with a squatty pot. Is that a good way to say that? <laughs> Short, it's shorter than the diameter. It's they're called an azalea pot, and because they don't really have deep root systems. And it, you know, and if you do it, if you repot your violets at least once a year, preferably every six months, you won't ever get that neck. It'll, it'll naturally you just kind of cover that neck. Now, when you're caring for your African violets, are you watering from the bottom? Are you watering with warm water? What are you doing? I, I water from the top. I know a lot of people. A lot of people um, wick water them, so they're sitting on reservoirs of water, and there's an acrylic string going up into the into the potting medium, and then it just continually draws water up, and that is a great way to do it. But I just water them from the top, and I but I don't you know I don't pour water on the leaves, but once in a while because they have fuzzy leaves, I will take them to the sink and spray them down because it's kind of an old wives' tale or that you need to or fake news as we call it that you can't get water on the leaves. They can actually grow outside in Africa. They get rained on. You just don't want to use cold water because that will disfigure the, not disfigure the leaves, but mark the leaves. And I always, I always make sure that I've taken a paper towel or Kleenex and I don't let the water sit in the very crown of it so that okay. it doesn't just sit there and, you know, rot. And I don't rot. put them right back in the window because I don't want the sun, you know, if the sun shining in the window, it could burn the leaves too. But it's all about the warm water and just not letting them, you know, the leaves have left the water sitting on them. Hmm. 
Well, I do the same things. I water my African violet using warm water from the sink and I do go over the top of them. So I always feel like a little bit of a rebel because that's always echoing in my head, you know, that the, the, the leaves aren't supposed to get wet. But I always figure, how else are they supposed to get clean? I suppose you could dust them off with a brush or something, but I just prefer to give them a quick shower and then I dry them off and I pop them back in. And I was at a an adorable little gift shop one time and the woman there had a bunch of African violets that were growing under piano lights, you know, those old brass piano lights. Yeah. And she said anytime she was at Goodwill or a thrift store, if she saw a piano light, she would grab them. And she grew many of them on her kitchen counter under piano lights. But in her little adorable gift shop that was called Stone Crop, she would grow African violets under piano lights. And so ever since then, if I see a piano light, I can't help but buy it. And then, of course, I, I put African violets. And now since then, I put other plants under piano lights as well. Why is that working? Do you know? Well, it's, you know, incandescent lights, which, which is probably what's in those, correct? Yep. Sort of, in, you know, like a light, regular light bulb. Yep. I know they're usually a different shape, but it's still the same concept. Plants can grow under those. You just can't have them too close because incandescent bulbs, as we know, get warm. It's yes. hot. So they work, but the, I just use fluorescent because it's cooler and I think it's more cost efficient too. But that I might have to, if I ever see a piano light, I think I'm going to buy one of those. That's very cool. Yeah, I don't know. I just thought it was kind of a charming little thing. And then and then my other tip for that, Lisa, if you do that, is I bought, you know, those little, they're like a little pedestal, a round pedestal. They almost look like a big chunky candle holder. Sometimes you'll see them at thrift stores. You could put a, yeah. you could put a drink dispenser on top of them. Well, I use those to elevate that piano light a little bit. So I have a glass terrarium and then I use, I like to use the frosted bulbs. I suppose that gives them a little bit of a, a barrier between that light, maybe not so harsh. And then I'll tip the light over that terrarium and that's my little hot tip on how I grow mine. But I, I love talking about African violets with people and just hearing how they do it and what they do and how they have success with them. Some people just have... Uh, these, if you look in the book, that picture, that lady's, every time we walk in that room and we go there once a month, it never looks any different. It's Are you kidding? Stunning. Really? No, she, never. Oh it's just it's so beautiful. And that's not, that's just one side of the room. I didn't show you the other. There's one other side that's like that as well. I have to ask, did you take all the pictures in this book by yourself? My daughter and I, but, but some of, you know, some of them aren't ours and you can, in the front, it shows the ones that they supplemented with. But yes, my daughter took almost all of the pictures. Wow. Let's talk a little bit about pots. Your chapter one starts out with either repotting or up-potting. I'm so curious your thoughts on terracotta. Do you use terracotta indoors with your house plants? What are your thoughts on that? I do. I do love terracotta and I do use a lot of it, but I'm a green girl and an orange and orange <laughs> and yellow <laughs> and pink. I like color. It was hard. They asked me to get some white pots some of the pictures you'll see there, there's like the first picture on page, I don't know, to 12, 10, page 10. It's all white pots. Like I had to, I'm using some of my antique McCoy pots, some Ikea pots because yeah. I don't have any white pots. So, um, but I, I do love terracotta, but I usually, um, I have, I have kind of a mix, but mostly color. Okay. But I, but if you're asking me like about the, you know, they're, they're good for some plants because they they breathe, you know, the air comes through them, the, the water comes through them. So if you have a plant that wants to stay a little drier, most of my cacti and succulents are in terracotta. Okay, and, and that's your preference. That I know likes a little more water, I might even, I, then I put it in either the glazed or a, I usually don't use plastic pots, but I don't, there's nothing wrong with plastic pots. I just like the terracotta okay. or the glazed terracotta. And then let's talk about plant stands. What plants do you like to put on plant stands? Do you have things that you're kind of partial to? Well, I have to tell you that it was funny. I just I did a show at a, it's at like a, one of those, rec they do reclaimed wood from Detroit and they had a, a craft show or not a craft, but like a, you know, a holiday market. Okay. I took plants there in my books and I found this like stand back in the corner. I'm like, Oh, look at that plant stand. I am a plant stand junkie. <laughs> 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 I probably, in my front window, there's probably 15 plant stands with plants on them. So all my ferns are on the plant stands. I have an aspidistra on a plant stand, my ZZ plant. 
everything. But, you know, it does look better if things are draping or, you know, vining down it. But I just, I love plants. I have my grandmother's plant stands. I have my mom just gave me her, her, her plant stand is a porch post with a top and a bottom on it that her dad made for her. She's had it. She's been married over 60 years. So, oh, no, wow. 50, probably over, over 50 years. 60 years now she's been married and she's had it that long. Her dad made it for her. So now I have it. And I, yeah, I love plant stands. Do you have any things that you like to repurpose? Do you have an item in your house that you've repurposed either as a cash pot or some type of container or stand that you just are particularly proud of? I am really into funnels right now. And I did a blog post about it. I use my dad's huge funnel and it has beautiful plants in it. He's probably like, Oh my gosh, you took my beautiful, you took my funnel from my garage and you put a plant in it. Um, but he, he would, he would be proud of me. He's not, he's not with us any longer, but, um, I do love funnels and I've got a couple of plants now in old funnels. Well, nothing is safe. Is it once you love house plants and you start thinking about all the different things you can put them in? That's true. And I have, you know, I will, the tip too is I am a big proponent of it's got to have a drainage hole. Okay. So if it's an antique pot and it doesn't, and it's something I just can't drill a hole in, I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm pretty good with, I can decipher whether it needs water or not. And, yeah. and, and you can do it with careful, you for being careful. But I have a diamond tip drill bit. It's a little expensive, um, but it will last probably most normal people that don't have a thousand plants in their home a really long time. But I, it just drills through anything. So if I find something in the Salvation Army that's cute, that's maybe a little pitcher or a little you know, a little creamer or something, I'll just drill a hole in it. Mm, that's great. And if you're nothing safe, can that, I, I look at every single thing in my life now, like I go to the antique shop or Salvation Army, I think a plant could go in that or an air plant could hang on that. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, I love to repurpose soup terrines, old soup terrines, and use them as yeah. planters. They're, I think they're great that way. Yeah. Do you, put, do you drill a hole in them? I don't. I use them as a cash pot, but I'm like you where I do pay attention to watering, but my strategy is I wait till they get dry, then I give them a good soak in the sink, I rinse them off, and then I let them, you know, dry a little bit there before I put them back in. So there might be a little bit of water leaking out the bottom, but then I figure it's a a nice little reservoir, but not overwhelming. And then I I wait a couple weeks and I do it again. So... That's, that's, that's perfect. And you're right. If you don't want to drill a hole in it, then don't just plant in it. Just use it as a cash pot. That's yeah. perfect. Yeah. Let's talk about something else. I, I ordered a couple of bags of this on Amazon. I love using it, actually. And it's horticultural charcoal. Do you use that? I don't. Okay. I know I know a lot of people put it in their terrarium. Yeah. I've, I've had a terrarium for I, I don't even know how many years now. And I just, I've never, I don't use, I don't use stones. I don't use charcoal i just use my soil mix for my it's really potting medium but it's you know i don't really think it has any soil in it and i put it clear to the bottom so i have more room and i'm just careful when i water it you don't use you need to use any kind of drainage material like little stones or anything in any of your pots because it's been proven that water doesn't move easily from smaller pores which is in your potting medium into those bigger pores between the rocks so yeah. you're saturating your soil before it ever drains into the rocks anyway I mean, it's okay if that's what a lot of people think and swear by it and they do it and like, that's fine. I think do whatever works for you. But I just don't use all that drainage. Plus, it makes the pot heavier. I've had back surgery. I don't, I try not to make anything too heavy. Yeah. That's why plastic is starting to look better to me. <laughs> ah, well, and yeah. along those lines, do you add a little extra perlite to your potting medium? Oh, yes. I don't buy commercial. My husband owns a, his family owns a garden center. So I can order big, huge bags of soil that are almost as tall as me, potting medium. And I have four different things. I, I buy the vermiculite, the perlite, and then I buy something that really has a lot of peat moss in it that I use for my violets. And then I buy something that's got a little bit more bark in it for my cacti and succulents. And okay. then I mix it with perlite and vermiculite. But if I were to go out and buy a commercial mix of any sort, in my opinion, and maybe they're better now because like, I haven't bought commercial potting mix in a really, really long time because I make my own. But I would add... I like I would take a third of that potting medium and add a, a third of perlite probably and almost a third of vermiculite and mix it really good because I don't think they drain well enough. 
I like that. I do the same thing. I get my perlite from Amazon. So it comes in this huge garbage bag and then it comes in a big box. And when it shows up, you know, you feel like, oh my gosh, this is going to be impossible. But then it's so light, it's ridiculous. But I love adding it. And when I'm working with my student gardeners, I'll say, be liberal with this. Don't hold back. I like to have a lot of perlite in my potting soil. I, I do too. I do too, but and I but I don't like it when it flows to the top, and I don't like how it gets brown on top. But you know, then I can just refresh the top layer of soil and not worry about it because it it really does make a huge difference. Ooh, let's talk about top dressing. Do you top dress your house plants? If you have a house plant that let's say it's been sitting there, I have it, my, the one that I did in the book is a fiddly fig, and I've had it for a long time, and it you could just see that you could start to see the roots at the top because everything is decomposing. All the time. We are too, right? We talked about that earlier. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> off, <laughs> off the record. In our and, pre-chat, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're all aging. So your, your potting medium is breaking down. And if you have a plant that's been in the same pot for a really long time, and really, I can't really lift it any longer. I can't repot it by myself. And it really doesn't need to. I want it to stay kind of in that pot. I don't need it to get any bigger. But I can start seeing the roots are starting to show at the top. And you're like, oh, man. Yeah. So, so sometimes you can just cover those roots back up with a nice top dressing but also, at the same time, if, if you're not repotting it often, you could even try to remove a little bit more of the soil if you can and then add fresh soil because that's like almost like giving them a shot in the arm, like a shot of vitamins because it's fresh soil, fresh potting medium, and maybe it has some nutrient value in it and it's refreshing for them. Yeah. The second section of your book talks about watering and fertilizing. Do people spend maybe too much time thinking about watering and fertilizing when they should be thinking more about light? Oh, yes. Yes. I think, you know, I think, especially the fertilizing, like I said, with African violets or any plant that should be blooming. They're like, but I gave it the bloom booster, I gave it more fertilizer, or or even a sick plant. You know, I have a plant that doesn't, it's it's not looking good, so I'm going to give it fertilizer. Well, first of all, you need to figure out what the problem is. Maybe it does need more light. Maybe you've overwatered it. Maybe you've underwatered it. But I always tell people, if you're sick and you have the flu or you have a cold, do you want someone to give you a five-course meal? No. That's not the time to fertilize your plant. You should fertilize your plant, like, all the time, and maybe it won't get sick. You could have fertilized it almost every time you water if you use, like, a quarter strength. Never use full strength all the time, unless you're doing it maybe once a month or once every couple months, and only from March through September. At least here in our northern states, we don't have enough light and they're not actively growing enough to fertilize them from like October through February. But yeah, I I think that people think that if their plant has a problem, maybe if you just give it fertilizer, it's going to make it bloom, it's going to make it be better. But when really, in fact, it probably just needs some more light, whether that be electric light or sunlight, a bit closer to the light source. How about temperature? What impact you know, does temperature play on your house plants? Do you think? I, I like when we were talking about the African violets and how mine don't always do that great. I also talked to you about I had lost some weight before. I was always hot, and now I'm quite cold all the time. My house used to be about sixty degrees, maybe fifty nine at night, and I my plants did. I think they do just fine, but now it's a little warmer in here. I don't think they're as sensitive. I mean, maybe they just get used to it. They knew it's cool in my house. I don't have to water them as much. Then, but yet there's some plants that once it gets below 50, I didn't turn my heat around in my sunroom fast enough, and I, all my euphorbia has lost every leaf. Oh, so there okay. are some plants that are very sensitive to cold, and then there's other plants that, you know, eh, whatever. It doesn't bother them. Okay. And, and a ten to, you know, dropping your heat at night is a good thing for them. They like, in nature, you know, temperature goes down when the sun goes down. So they like that you get a change in temperature. Yeah, great point. Um, You have this section on problem solving, which for, you know, so many people, they don't even know where to start with houseplants when they run into challenges, whether it's pests or disease. What are some of your go-to tips that you like to tell people about when it comes to problem solving or troubleshooting what's going on with your houseplant? You know, first of all, when you do have a problem, don't just run out and buy some horrible insecticide and start spraying or don't jump to conclusions. First of all, figure out what's wrong. Do I have an insect? Do I have a disease? And a lot of times it may be, does it need more light? Is it a stressed out plant because it hasn't had enough light? I may have forgot to water it while I was on vacation and then I overwatered it when I came home and it's had some stress factors. And a stress plant 
is going to be more susceptible to diseases and insects. You just have to pay attention. Everything's about, you know, paying attention. Every time you water it, kind of look at it. You know, and always turn it a quarter turn so your plant grows symmetrically. It doesn't lean toward the light. So while you're turning it, you know, look at it. Kind of look underneath and say, wow, I didn't, I didn't see that white thing there before. Is that something or did, you know, the cat get a piece of hair on it, you know, or a hairball or something? Yeah. And, and then you find out, oh, I have a mealybug. So you, you just have to pay attention and really look at everything. Look at it when you're watering it. Hmm. I was thinking as I was looking at this section of your book, this might have been the hardest section of your book to photograph because if you love houseplants and you take care of them, things don't get this out of whack. So, you know, try to find an example of this problem or another to photograph might have been a challenge for you. Well, when you have as many houseplants as I do, and, and I, I was so busy writing the book, things suffered. So it wasn't as hard as you think. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm always bringing houseplants in, much to my husband's dismay. We don't need one more houseplant, obviously. But you got to be careful, too, when you bring plants in, I think, that you should try to put them away from your other plants until you figure out if maybe there were some eggs there that have now hatched and now you have an outbreak of something. Yeah. And now it's getting on all your other plants. But in my home, there's no place to do that. <laughs> there's no place that has a light source that it doesn't have plants in front of it or under it. So it's hard for me to do that. So when I bring new plants in, sometimes they bring things in and I don't realize it. Yeah. So I do have a problem with things like that that maybe most people wouldn't because they have a place they can put their plant when they bring it home and they don't have 50 plants sitting around getting bugs. Yeah. So. Well, it's kind of like kids. I've got four kids and invariably they get sick. One of them will get sick. And as much as I say, wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands, the odds are not in my favor. Somebody else is going to come down with it. So I kind of think about my houseplants the same way because I have two designated areas in my house for houseplants. And so I'm kind of limited and you just cross your fingers. Oh, yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. And it it is, I feel like sometimes the greenhouses, if they don't have a a high turnover, you know, they're very hesitant to spray heavy-duty insecticides or things that would get rid of them. And, And I don't blame them. But then once you get a breakout, it kind of spreads quickly. And in your home, too. I'm, I'm, I, have a, I fight with mealybugs. Okay. Now, let me ask you this. So I remember when I interviewed Shane Smith of the Cheyenne Botanic Garden, and he also was one of the first writers about greenhouses and growing in greenhouses. He reminded me that so many issues can be taken care of with sharp streams of water. Is that a strategy you employ as well? Yes, I do. I do try to wash it first, yes, and get as much off as I can, especially with aphids. Like, aphids are gone. Like, if you have aphids on your new growth, and they only like the new growth, but they're very easy to wash off, so that's not a problem. Um, The other ones, like mealybugs and scale, because they're stuck on, that's a little hard. That's, you know, hard to wash them off with water, but it's a good start, and especially the spider mites, definitely, because they're making webs. They like dry plants, so... It's a good idea to wash your plants off occasionally if you can, just as a rule, because that does make get rid of a lot of things, get rid of bugs. Because dust on your plants cuts down on the the light that's getting to the leaf, so then they're not photosynthesizing as much, they're not as healthy, so it's it's good to take your plants and wash them off anyway. Put them in the shower. My husband hates that. I put all the ones from our bedroom, like, in the shower, and then I'll forget about them, and I'll hear the door open, and I'll hear, really? I'm like, oh, Honey, I'll get those out real quick. <laughs> yeah. He stays yeah, with you even though you shower those plants. I love it. Yeah, yeah, I've got a shower. They love it. They love to get a nice cleaning. Got to give them a shower. They need a shower just like us. Yep, absolutely. Well, you've mentioned mealybugs a little bit, and you have this great photo of reminding people of the power of sometimes just everyday things that we have in our houses that can really help with house plants. One of those things is rubbing alcohol. I've talked to a lot of people over the years about using rubbing alcohol. What do you do with it? And is it in your go-to kit for taking care of house plants? Oh, yes. Yes. Mealybugs are a soft scale. And so they have that layer that looks like cotton and regular scale too. If you touch them with alcohol, it dries them out. You know, alcohol dries out our hands, like all the hand sanitizer and makes your skin dry. It dries you out. So if you touch them with a Q-tip or, or you know, a cotton ball with alcohol on it, it's going to kill them because it's going to dry their little bodies out, desiccate them. It is a good go-to, and it's, I, don't, I don't know if you would call that organic, 
but it certainly isn't hurting anyone and you're not inhaling any toxic fumes if you're just using a Q-tip with some alcohol on it. Yeah. Is there anything else that you like to use that you think everyone else should be using as well? Oh, yes. Neem oil is really great, a great product because it's also me, and I think it is OMRI certified, but I'm not going to, don't quote me. <laughs> I use Rose RX because we own an independent garden center, so I get the independent version of neem oil. It's called Rose RX. It's good because it's an insecticide, a miticide, and a fungicide. So it's good for roses. But it's already pre-mixed. You know, I get this already ready to spray bottle, so it's already mixed for me, and it's easy to use. And that works very well for powdery mildew. It's a miticide, so it would work for your mites. And it's kind of got a little bit of oil in it, so it will smother those scale. So that, that is a great product. Now, what is your preferred way for using it? Do you wait till you see a problem? Yes, I wait till I see a problem. Okay. I don't. <laughs> I've been trying a new product. It's actually derived, there's something called azadiractin, which is something that's, it's like a neem oil that's derived from the seeds of the neem tree, so it's a lot more potent, I guess you might say. So, and you can use that as like a preventative, because what it does is it changes their eating habits. It makes them so they can't eat. It's kind of probably a slow death, but I don't care with those mealybugs. <laughs> So that works pretty good, too. (laughs) Okay, now you have to say that product again because I know people are backing up 30 seconds. They want to hear the name of it again. The derivative is azadiractin. I think you can buy it as azazol or just look for something that has azadiractin in it. And it's an oil that comes from the seeds of the neem tree. So it's more potent. So it works better. And I think it's out now for, it comes in a powdered form. So you can only mix as much as you need. Hmm. I'm spraying my mealybugs with it, and we'll, uh, I'll probably write a blog post about it when I see how good it works. Sure. Does it have a smell? Okay. That pro- didn't, but they gave me another something else that was like you could spray it with it, and it had cloves and peppermint and stuff like it in it. Oh, that's and that, nice. That did smell, and it, but it's not that wasn't an unpleasant smell. Yeah. Well, let's talk about plant profiles. About half of your book is devoted to different house plants that people can grow. And I was delighted to see how you divvied these up. You put them in three categories. The first is easy to grow. The second is moderately easy to grow. And then finally, there's challenging to grow. I like that because I think it gives people confidence when they see an expert such as yourself categorize plants in this way. And then especially when you look in that challenging to grow section and you see, hey, Lisa thought this was challenging as well. Thank you. And I will have people that have said to me, well, I find that, let's say, the clivia is really easy to grow. And it is an easy to grow plant, but to me, it's not always easy to get to flower. And the point of growing it is for the flowers. And it's all just what worked or didn't work for me. So there may be plants in here that some people are like, well, that's easy to grow. Maybe it is for you. But in my opinion, (laughs) in my experience, I should say, this wasn't for me. And I have heard, you know, I'm on some houseplant Facebook pages and other people are like, oh, I can't grow that. So Hmm. I felt confident that it wasn't just me. Okay, that's great. Let's see, that's good to know. That's validation. There's social proof that some of these are really, truly challenging. So maybe stay away. Yes. Right. And when I say challenging, it may just be that it takes more time. It needs more attention. It may need a certain something to make it flower that isn't something you can just leave it sitting where it was and it's just going to do that for you. Yeah. So to me, that makes it more challenging just because it's more time taken up. Yeah. For a lot of people, that is a challenge. Time is a challenge. Yeah, exactly. Well, in this easy to grow section, why don't we pick your favorite dirty dozen? your favorite 12 plants in the easy-to-grow category, what would you pick? I do love the very first one, air plants. I'm in love with air plants. I have them hanging in almost every window in little glass globes, and I I just love them. <laughs> and I think they're easy. A lot of people make them a little harder because you either miss them or you soak them. And a lot of people, well, you can just miss them. Really, it would be better if you soaked them. Okay. Drain them upside down. Let that water run out because they're not naturally growing completely upright which is the way you may have them in a container or sitting in a little whatever you have them sitting in. On trees, they're naturally kind of grown at a 45-degree angle, so the water kind of drains out of them. And if you have the, leave them standing with water in them, they're going to rot and fall apart. I've done this. <laughs> you know. But, and, you know. They, and they really like some good light. They just can't you know, be on your coffee table in, the, in the, your dark family room. Yeah. They're living things, and they need light to grow just like all other plants. I love them. So let's just walk through this one more time, because for folks who have not had success with air plants, they're in your easy-to-grow 
Walk us through. Well, I, I, I usually ask them when the last time they watered them or soaked them because I don't want to soak it two days in a row or something. Okay. Um, but I soak it once a week. I would get bring it home and soak it. And then I have them in little containers that are antique. I have one with a little gnome, little gnome guy. It's old. And I didn't want to drill a hole in it, so it has an air plant in it. You know, it's just sitting there. I didn't have to drill a hole. I have, I have them hanging in old bed springs. I have them on the wall. Huh. You know, I have them everywhere. And then I soak them once a week. And then I drain them on a towel for, you know, until I, sometimes I forget about them and they sit there all day. But I try to let them drain for a good amount of time so that there's no water left in the very middle of the plant. And then I make sure I put them back and I have them either under lights, like I have a lot of lights on my underneath the, my cupboards so that my counter has plants on them. I told you there's plants everywhere in this house, everywhere, <laughs> <laughs> everywhere. Or I put them back in the little balls that hang in the windows. And I have them hanging in the south windows, west windows, south window. They love the south window. They're like floating, like they're reproducing quickly because they really like some good light. That's great. What's next on your list? I am in love with Sansevierias. I collect them. When I took, I didn't know they were using just one picture for each plant. So when I, like on the Sansevieria, or the mother-in-law's tongue, or what did we call it? Oh, the bird's nest Sansevieria. Okay. I have, you know, like four things underneath that. So I sent them, I have a golden honey, I have the black star, the jade, the starlight. So I would send all those to them, but they just used one. So I have all the cultivars that you see under Sansevieria, the mother-in-law's tongue and the bird's nest snake plant, or the regular snake plant, sorry. I go by botanical names in my mind. All those cultivars I have, I probably have 15 varieties of, of Sansevieria, if not more. I just love them. And they have such a bad rap. <laughs> because? But I really like them. Well, they, they look at them as an old, dingy plant because everybody says you can put them in the dark. and you, They can take low light. Well, they're, they actually grow in Africa. And they are out probably in like in a desert. And when they give them good light plants, they will break a pot. They will bust a pot because they grow so well. So most people have seen them in dark corners. They're falling over. They're dusty. They're dingy. They just have a bad rap. But there's so many different kinds. And if you give them good light, they will love you forever. And they just multiply. I just love them. Mm-hmm. I don't know how to explain it. <laughs> they so, are tough, and they're easy to grow. Is there anything that you do special for your Sansevieria? I just make sure they have good light. Mine are there's none in a dark corner. They don't get low light in my house. They get as much light as I can give them, and they okay. they reward me by multiplying and being very happy. Okay. All right, number three. I really love aglaonema or Chinese evergreen. That is one of my new favorite plants. They've come out with so many colors. And actually, there's one on the front cover of the book, and that's the one that's kind of like the original Aglaonema or Chinese Evergreen. But now they have ones called Pink Dalmatian. They have red ones. They have all the different kinds of names. They're colorful. I have them in every room, every window practically. They're on a west window, probably about four or five feet back. They're still bright and colorful and beautiful. I'm sure people have seen them. They just might not know it's called Chinese Evergreen. Well, these ones you'll notice now because they've flooded the market in the last few years. Like they'll be pink polka dotted and they have kind of big, almost not fleshy leaves, but they're not thin either. They're kind of a nice thick, like a posos leaf. They come in these colors. They're kind of upright. They're bushy. The stems are kind of fleshy. They, you know, they are forgiving of not being watered all the time and they don't need to be watered all the time, but they're forgiving if you forget. And they're just, they're beautiful. And they can kind of take not low, low light, but they're pretty good about keeping their color in a moderate light. Yeah. And they're now, really easy to grow. Now, what do you like to do with them? That's on my kitchen table. I have two of them, and they're pink, and I just love them. They're right on the kitchen table because they're so, so pretty, and I love that light there, and I can see them all the time. So that's where mine are. All right. What's next on your list? I really love the Monstera, and I like the plan of Instagram. I've always loved Monstera. It's easy, if you, but you have to have a lot of room for it. But there's some smaller versions are different that kind of look like them but aren't. There's a Monstera vine, but it's not really a Monstera. That's in the book called um, Mini Monstera Vine, but it's a Rapid Defora. Okay. So it looks like a miniature Monstera vine. I like anything that has that really cool Monstera look. I love any philodendron, like the heart-shaped. I love the heart-shaped old-fashioned vining philodendron. It's got heart-shaped leaves, and now they have Brazil, and it's got both chartreuse green and dark green variegated. Any variegated plant, I'm all over. Love variegated plants. Variegation catches your eye. Yes. Yes. I like variegated. If I, why would anybody get a plain green plant when you can have a variegated one? <laughs> <laughs> That's my motto. 
And, you know, as another plant that's really gone crazy that I love, too, that is the pothos. You know, that's that vine that I went to a, a relative, a cousin, and they had a house that had one of those cathedral ceilings, and there was a beam going across it, and it literally started down at this side of the room, went up across the beam, and down the other side. And a lot of times the stems are naked, and there's only, like, leaves at the end, but people love them, and they frame windows with them. Well, now they have ones called Enjoy and Glacier, and they're white, variegated, and they're just beautiful. And they have a neon one that's chartreuse green, my favorite color. There's just so many varieties now, and they're beautiful, and they're so easy to grow. Now, how do you take care of yours? I mean, do you really like them when they're so long and leggy, or do you? How no. do you? How do you do it? Well, I don't mind it. I like. I have one of my. Um, I have a shelf in my bedroom, and it's kind of hanging down. And I let it. I let it hang down, maybe five feet or so. But when it starts, to be, maybe when it gets starts getting naked, you know, the stem, I'll cut it clear back to the soil line. If you want them to stay kind of more like a, when you buy them from the store, a lot of times if it's a smaller pot, it will just be like a little bush. It won't be a long vining plant. And you can keep it that way. When they start vining, if you cut them back to the soil line, it will start a new plant at that soil line. And you can keep it more like a little shrub. I guess that's how I want to describe it. And then you can take that piece that you took off. You know, a lot of times I can start those in water or I'll start them in soil or just stick them back in the soil and it'll, it'll, then you'll have it a fuller plant. Okay. Or you can share it with a friend. What else is on your list? Um, you know, everybody loves succulents. You live in Minnesota. I live in Michigan. Yep. But they don't grow very well here in the winter time. <laughs> we bring them in. We want to bring them in. We want them to be look like those Pinterest pictures from California, and they don't always quite look like that here in the Midwest, unless you have them growing under electric lights or a really good, really bright set of south or west windows. But Haworthias, they're succulents. They have little stripes in them and little polka dots, and they really like a lower light than most succulents. So you could put them in your west window, your east window, and they'll do great. And they're, they're called the zebra plant in the book. Yeah, the ze- yeah I was just going to say, or, or a zebra plant. Well, zebra. and right next to that is a plant that you've mentioned a couple of times now that I think is a sentimental favorite of yours, and it's the ZZ plant. Oh, yes. I just talked to someone the other day about that, and I go, it's just such an easy plant. She goes, easy, easy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, you're right. It's easy, it's easy. Yeah. Because no one said the botanical name. Forget it. Zamiocultus zamiofolia. Let's let's just call it the ZZ plant. Yep. I just like it because it is so, it's kind of like the cast iron plant or the aspidistra, which has also gotten kind of a bad rap, but I have one called Milky Way. You know, it's variegated. It's got little spots like star. It looks like a starry sky. Love that one. It's in my dining room in the corner three feet from the west window, but it doesn't really get any, it never gets any direct light, and it's beautiful. And the ZZ plant is the same way. It, it's right next to it. It's got really shiny leaves. It, it has fleshy roots, so you don't have to water it like crazy, like some plants. You can kind of forget about it. And it's just a shiny green thing that it can really grow in low light. Hmm. Now, has yours ever bloomed? No, or it ever will in the amount of light I'm giving it. Even though a plant may take low light, if it's a naturally blooming plant, it's going to probably need more light than what we can give it in our home. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. Yep. I always tell people, even though we're like standing in front of a bright sunny window and we think, well, there's ample light here, it's nothing in comparison to what that plant would get in its natural habitat. Yes, that is correct. And I have to say, I, some things I say, do as I say, not as I do. Because <laughs> I have so many plants, I can't do everything good like I tell everyone. I know what you're supposed to be doing, but I don't always do it. But wash your windows. I don't take my plants outside in the summer because there's too many and it would take too long and I just don't. They're house plants. But a lot of people do. And then they bring them back in and you have to acclimate them taking them out. You can't just plop them out in the sun. They're going to get sunburned yeah. like we do after a You know, we're all pasty after being in all winter. Mm-hmm. And then you plop me out on the patio, I would burn terribly as well. So you got to kind of take them out slowly, put them under a shade tree and do the same thing coming back in. But also wash your windows because anything that's blocking, you'd be surprised how dirty your windows are if you really, you wash them and you're like, wow, it's like they're not even there. Any dirt or anything that's on your windows is blocking their photosynthetic process. So it would be better if you have clean windows. That makes a huge difference. That is a great tip and it's something that a lot of people wouldn't even think of. And of course it will rain the next day and get all covered again, but... (laughs) (laughs) Because it always still. never fails when you wash your windows, it rains. Yeah. It really does make a big difference. Yeah. So, and I like, I'm, I'm not, I like to wash windows, so I know, and I like to vacuum too. So some people really hate me, but <laughs> it makes a big difference. So I definitely. love it. 
What else is on your list? What should be in our shopping cart for easy um, house plants? The ponytail palm for the oh, year yeah. of Rita Bada. That's on there. That I've had that since uh, 1984 when I went to college. I bought it in a two-inch pot at Kmart in Mount Pleasant. <laughs> and, <laughs> and how big is it now? Living. How big is it well, now? It, it, well, I have it on a stand because that is one plant that my cat likes anything that's grassy or strappy. Oh, sure. So if, if that's in his reach, he will. He does chew on it. Okay. So that it's up on a stand, but it's probably a good four or five feet tall. Ooh. Yes. It's gotten very large. It probably should be bigger. I mean, like if you went to the botanical garden, there's some that are as big around as, you know, my dining room table and 10 feet tall, but mine's not that big. Yeah. But I really love those. They're easy and they're they're also forgiving of water because they have that huge caudex. You know, it's like a, a swollen stem that stores water. So that comes up and it flows over like a fountain. It's just a very it's a pretty plant. I'd love to get your input on this. Sometimes how these tropicals can be sold to consumers, especially in the big box stores. And when I think about ponytail palms, I almost always see them sold this way in the big box stores. And that is you have this palm in this pot and then the top is covered with this gravel that's been glued together. Do you know what I'm talking about? Oh, yeah. What do you do about that? Many plants have been chipped away. (laughs) I, you know, they do that for shipping because it, somehow the glue they use, it still lets water through, but it's kind of weird. But it's hard, it's hard to chip it off, but I usually do. I don't really use a lot of moss on top of the soil or stones like on my cacti and succulents. I yeah. do some of them, but the ones that kind of, I like know what they need for water. And, but I like to be able to see my potting medium because you can kind of tell sometimes just from looking at it if it needs water or not. Yeah. So I chip that off and it's not easy. <laughs> no, it isn't. I'm so glad to talk to you about this because this is exactly something that people encounter in real life, getting house plants, which can sometimes be a little bit of an impulse buy. And then when they get it home, it's like, now what do I do? And I've got this weird substance on the top. They're not sure what to do with it. So how do you chip it away? I like, kind of get a, I kind of get a like a kitchen knife and okay. I kind of just start kind of prying it up, trying to pry it. Okay. It's sometimes not easy, and it usually usually there's a, a ring of glue left around your pot. It's, mm-hmm. it's kind of unless you repot it, it's kind of discouraging. But yeah. I understand, and it, it is a, a genius thing because it, you do get your plants that way. You know, there's actually potting medium left in them, not dumped all over the box or whatever. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, I really do like to see what's going on down there. Yeah. Well, and I love that <laughs> tip for anyone who's listening going, now, why would I take that off? The whole point is that you can really see what's going on with the soil. You can see if it's dry. Right. And the, true, I, I tell people to stick their finger in the soil to, to, to test the wetness or dryness of your plant. How can yeah. they do that when there's rocks? You can't, and I always feel bad for the plants a little bit that come shipped this way, only because I think it sends a message to plant buyers that they don't need to do anything with this plant. They can just set it on a shelf and forget about it because you have this hard surface on the top that doesn't look like it's supposed to get watered. And so I just think it's kind of a weird message that's getting sent to the plant owners that that take these plants home. So I love your tip of taking the rocks off. I do that a lot, especially if I love the container and I want to put something else in it, then I'll take all those rocks off and I'm scraping it off with the razor blade along the the side of the yeah, pot. Just get a knife out to yeah. scrape the rocks off the pot. A lot of times, I mean, they're always on the little bonsai plants. Yes. And they're stuck to the stem. Yeah. And you're like, Oh, and, and don't get me started on the painted succulents. Okay. We will not do that. We will not do that. Uh, I don't like those. <laughs> All right. Tell us a few more of your favorites. I think we have time for a handful and then we'll go into some of the medium and then the ones that maybe we should stay away from because they're high maintenance. I really like the ficus and I know a lot of people are, well, they drop all their leaves every time I move them. That's true, but there's other kinds of ficus called a saber leaf or a banana leaf fig and that is beautiful in my window right now. It's gorgeous. It, I just like them. And then some of them don't all drop their leaves. And it's a nice tree form. And mine has these long, strappy leaves. Beautiful plant. Okay. I really love the a hornea or hornea. I don't even know how to say it very well. It's the lifesaver plant. It's not the most attractive plant when it's not blooming, but it's still it's a cute little succulent. I have it on my south windowsill. It, and then all of a sudden, it'll just burst out with these little, weird, star-shaped flowers that look like they have a lifesaver in the middle. Yeah. Anything that I can get kids interested in plants and something blooms like this for them and they've seen that happen and it wasn't too hard to do that because they don't need 
tons and tons of fun, and they still will bloom. I, anything I can do to get kids excited about plants, I'm very happy about that. Ah, uh, Lisa, you're speaking in language. I say that all the time. I always tell people we need to find the cool factor when it comes to hooking kids on plants. And the Lifesaver plant, that bloom is gorgeous. When people see that bloom, then they'll say, what plant is that? And then they'll want it. But when it's not blooming, it's very easy to overlook. Oh, yes. Michigan State University had a houseplant sale, and I went to it. And right next to me, they had a bunch of these. It's also Stapelia, Hornia. They kind of look the same. They're, they have those star-shaped flowers. And there was a whole table of them. But one was blooming, and of course I took a picture of it to, you know, put it on my Facebook page or whatever, but the rest of them weren't. But of course that was the first thing bought, was the one in bloom. So all these people are kind of looking at this plant like, what is this? And then I was standing right there, because I had my book and I had a table of my book, and I'm like, look, this is the flower. And I sold all those plants in like, you know, an hour. (laughs) Here's a picture of the flower. And they're like, what? (laughs) That's the flower? I'm like, oh yeah. And that was all, you know, a lot of college kids came to that. So that's great. Yeah, I got them going on that. That's great. What are your last three picks in this category? And then we'll move into medium care. I love, and everybody loves, the Phalaenopsis orchid. You can get it anywhere now, reasonably priced. It flowers for a very long time. And then people are like, well, then what do I do with it? You kind of treat it like the African violet. You put it in the east window. As far as the light source, it's about the same really for an African violet. And then you just take it to the sink once a week. You run water through it. Make sure you do not leave water sitting in the middle of those leaves that come together. Yeah. I've done that. It rots. They all fall off, and you're devastated because I did that to a variegated one. I was mm. very upset. And then if you leave them there next year, you're going to get even more flowers. I mean, every year they're going to flower for you, and they're going to get bigger and more flowers. It's worth it, and it's easy, in my opinion. Tell people the name of that again. Oh, the Phalaenopsis orchid or the, the moth orchid. Yeah. Is what they're and you can you see them in every store you go into now. They sell them. That's great. Um, number forty-eight, the Neo Regilia. It's a bromeliad, and it is way misunderstood. I think it has the most beautiful foliage. It's a vase-shaped plant, and that cup in the middle or the vase, you just put water in there. It's called a Neo Regilia, and all you do is water, put fresh water in there, like or maybe once a week, change the water, put or put add water, fresh water to it. The water that runs over can go into the potting medium, but really they're epiphytes. They usually grow on trees where they're from and in jungles. So they just put them in potting medium for us to be able to buy them and have a place to set them, right? Mm. So it's not really necessary that you water the potting medium. You can once in a while, but you just have to keep that vase filled with water. It doesn't need a ton of light. I mean, when I say ton of light, I'm saying it doesn't have to be in the south window. You could have it in east window or west window, and you're still going to have a beautiful, colorful plant, and it's easy. Just water the cup. Yeah. You have to keep water in it. That's something you can leave water standing in and it's not going to die. Okay. It's going to thrive. So that is a very good plant. Um, I love gasterias. They kind of look like Haworthias, the succulent that doesn't need as much light as like an Echeveria or an Aeonium, which is the ones that look like roses that you see in all the Pinterest pictures that everybody wants. You bring them home and they get leggy and not as attractive as they used to be. So a gasteria, that's the one called Ox Tongue. I have some that were my grandmother's. I've given them to everybody. They multiply prolifically, and you can share them with friends and family and make more of them. Hmm. Can I ask you about one of them? (laughs) Sure. Hoyas. I love Hoyas. Oh, yeah. Hoyas. That was probably my last one. I have so many Hoyas, and I absolutely love them. And they're so out there now. The big boxes are carrying across the farm is growing a lot of different varieties. It's awesome. Yeah. And I love when I get a Hoya that's blooming. I recognize that scent. I love the bloom. It has that cool factor that hooks kids, which is fantastic. There's just a lot to love about Hoyas. They're so easy to propagate, too. Definitely. All you have to have is a a little bit of a stem and one leaf. And you pin it to a moist potting medium, and you'll be amazed how fast it will grow new plants. (laughs) One leaf and an inch of stem is all you need. It's crazy. Yeah, they're wonderful. And they bloom, and there's one called the Shooting Star Hoya, it's a Hoya multiflora, and it's not like a succulent leaf like most of the Hoyas are. It's really easy to grow, and it just has these flowers that they look like shooting stars. Yeah, it's a screensaver on my phone. It has been for years. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, so if you can find that one, that's a beautiful plant. Yeah, that's fantastic. Let's go through the, the moderately easy to grow. Maybe pick half a dozen of your favorites here, and then we'll talk about the ones we should maybe avoid. You know, I love, 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 love. It's a mini orchid. It looks like a little pansy. That's why I first bought it. 
So it's a little miniature. I have it hanging in my west window on the side of the cupboard. And it blooms for me, not all the time, you know, not like every day, but there's blooms on it often through the year. And it's so easy. I soak it once a week with my tillandsias. I hang it back up. It gets good light in the west window. And I have these little miniature flowers all the time. Okay. It's, it's supposed to be fragrant, but, you, you know, if you tried to smell it, it would go up your nose. I mean, that's how little the flower is. But it's just such a, it's so unusual and so cute. It's not probably not too hard to find online or at, we have orchid shows here. You know, like the Orchid Society will have a show. Yeah. The biggest plant going right now, number 14, is the um, Chinese money plant, Ilea peperomoides. Yes like the Instagram plant of the year right now. <laughs> and it really is easy to grow if you can find it. And Optimara, which grows all the African violets, they just started offering it. Um, I saw it at one of the trade shows. And so it will probably be easier to find. And it's such a cute plant. It has like little round leaves and that's, that's a cute plant and very easy to grow. Any of the ferns, I have a lot of ferns in here. I love ferns. I've had my grandma's Boston fern, great grandma, since well, I've had it for 33 years. My mom's had one for since she was married in 1957. She got it at her bridal shower. So I think the problem with Boston ferns is that people buy them outside for like their front porch, and then they try to bring them in and they drop every leaf. Yeah. And they're like, I can't grow a Boston fern. But if you start out with a small Boston fern and you grow it always in the house, you're going to have great luck with it because it's used to being inside. It doesn't have as many leaves as it would have outside because it has good light. And when it, you know you're not bringing it in and out and shocking it, it's just if you're going to have a Boston fern. Buy one that's just for your house. Yep. And I start agree. out with a smaller one. Yep. I and then agree. it's a beautiful plant. It's in my east window and it's been there for over 33 years. Um, Baghorn ferns are very cool. And, you know, those are easy too. I have mine mounted on a board. I take it to the sink or to the shower. I water it. I let it drain and I put it back on the wall. And that's really great. You know, I think that that would be something that teenage boys would probably really like that because it kind of looks like deer antlers. When I sold them at the nursery, men always came in and wanted them because they look like deer antlers. That was a manly plant, I guess, is what mm. they were thinking. I put it in moderate because a lot of people have them mounted on pieces of wood, and so you have to take them off the wall. you got to take them to the sink, you know, yeah. let them drain, bring them back. So as long as it has good light, it's pretty cool and easy to grow. How about two more? Um, you know, of course, we can't go without mentioning the fiddle leaf fig. And I put that moderately easy to grow. It might have even should have been in the challenging it's such a big plan on Instagram. Everybody wants one. It's on every decorating magazine you find, any HDTV show, they're using them. They're not as easy as everybody thinks they are, like the other ficus, because it is a ficus. Like I told you, you know, it move, you move it five feet and it drops all its leaves. <laughs> Once you get it to kind of where it needs to be and you've got its watering down, it's not too bad to grow. I have one in my sunroom. But I also want to tell everybody, too, social media is a very powerful thing. And just because it's on social media and everybody has one doesn't mean it's the easiest plant to grow. Yeah. They may have only just went out and bought it that day to take a picture. You know what I mean? Yeah. But for the long run, it's a nice plant. It needs a lot of light and it's a little touchy with the watering. But once you get it figured out, then it is a nice plant. And it is a very big architectural plant, that's for sure. Because it's so big, I have to ask, what do you do to keep it clean? Are you doing this one by hand with a damp cloth, wiping down the leaves, or are you actually giving this a shower a couple of times No, later? I can't move it. That's the one I top dress because I can't move it. Yeah. Or they do have these things that, like two like, cotton gloves, they, ha- they make them, I think they're called plant paws or something, but, or even just two sponges or two gloves, and you just yeah. wipe them down. Okay. And that, that's easy to do. If you can move it and put it in your shower, it would love it. In, any plant's going to love to have it, the dust rinsed off in a nice shower, but if you can't move it, then, yeah, just wipe it down with a sponge or a, a damp cloth or something. And how about pruning with your fiddle leaf? Are you doing any pruning of the leaves? Uh, the only thing I did show in the book, and I was so excited that it worked, because I'll be honest, I'd never done it. A lot of people have come to me with plants that are too tall for the house anymore, and maybe it was grandma's plant or maybe it's a sentimental plant. What do I do now? It's hitting the ceiling, so I'm just going to throw it out. You can air layer it. So in the book, I air layered my fiddly fig and then they needed another picture. And, you know, of course, it took many months to write the book and get all the pictures in and everything. And I went back and it actually had worked and the roots had grown into the moss. So now I can cut it off and I have a shorter plant. But you can, you can also prune, but start when it's young. Try to keep it pruned down instead of getting letting it hit the ceiling and then chopping it. Does that make sense? Yeah. You know, prune it a little bit every once, every, every couple of years or every year, give it a little bit of a trim. So that way you're keeping it smaller and then it's not going to be so crazy when it hits the ceiling and then you have to chop it off. Yeah. 
Well, and tell people a little bit about air layering if they've never done it before. That's usually with a plant that's kind of got more of a woody stem than a soft stem. So something that's like a ficus, a silly fig. You're going to cut like a little slit. Let's say it's six foot tall and you, you need it to be three feet tall. You go down three feet from the top, cut a slit, a slanted slit upwards. I put a toothpick in there to keep it open. So you're not cutting through it. You're not girdling it. You're just making a little slice halfway through it or maybe a quarter of the way through the stem. And then you're going to wrap wet sphagnum moss around it and then tie plastic wrap around it. You have this little, you know, it's wrapped at the top and wrapped at the bottom, and you have a little plastic wrap there with moss in it. And if, and if you keep that moss wet, which because you have plastic wrap on it and it was moist to begin with, it's kind of like a terrarium. It'll stay wet. Then it will send out roots from that slit. And it's going to take a few months to do this. Yep. And then you can, when it, when the roots are out, then you can cut it off and it's the same plant, but now you only have a three feet plant or a foot, one foot plant, wherever you cut the slit. Now you just have a short plant again. And if it was a sentimental plant, it's still the same plant. It's just shorter. Yeah. And it works incredibly <laughs> I, well, doesn't it? It did. I've never, I, like I said, I had never done that, but I needed to do it for the book. So we needed pictures of it. And so there it worked. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You did a great job. I loved your pictures. I thought your bows were so cute. Your little green bows tying the spag <laughs> moss on that looked fantastic. So yeah, definitely a great option for that. And I also just have to say that in your family, you guys really do a great job of hanging on to your legacy plants. You just casually mention, oh, yeah, my mom's had this plant for 50 years or something like yeah. that. It, it, you just do such a great job of hanging on to your legacy plants and then oh, sharing you. them throughout your family. That's really great. In fact, it's the picture of the hanging plant. That is one of the pieces of Grandma's fern. And it's oh. in an orange pot. It was my mom's. And she had two. And she's like, can you take this? So I took that home. Some pictures I did, hadn't done for the book. Like I didn't have a picture of a hanging plant. So they had just put one in. And I'm like, I really don't like that picture. Can I take one of my own and submit it? And they're like, yes. Yeah. So that macrame hanger, is my first macrame hanger I made with my great Aunt Violet when I was oh. probably a teenager because she's been gone for a really long time. <laughs> and then the pot and the fern was my great-grandmother's and then my mother's and now it's mine. I love so it. I love that picture because that's, that's definitely a sentimental plant. This picture, but I went just really quick when you were talking about me doing the picture of the fiddle leaf fig. I have green nails. I've had green nail polish on for about probably 10 years. The first day I got this book, I'm flipping through it, just literally like flipping through it. And I stopped and I went, oh my gosh, whose hands are those? And they're mine. <laughs> and they, <laughs> they took my green nail polish off. <laughs> they did. They did. Oh. And it's so weird because it is, if you know me, it's kind of weird. And it, to me, it was like creepy, like, oh my gosh, those aren't mine. But, you know, it's normal. Normal people have these color nails. Yes. <laughs> it's just not me. Mine are sparkly green all the time. That was a little weird to me. Oh, honestly. But they want the plants. If, the you, if I had bright, sparkly green nails right there, you wouldn't notice what I was doing. Oh, honestly. I well, know. that's your signature thing, though. So I know my daughter the other day said to my other daughter, do you remember mom used to have like pink nails or red nails at Christmas? And she's like, yep. And I go, nope, not anymore. <laughs> They're just green. <laughs> Been for a long, long time. Wow. Well, let's cover challenging to grow. Let's give people some hope here. If they've tried these and it hasn't gone well, then they should just be giving themselves, I guess, a pass to go buy something else because these are high maintenance plants or higher maintenance plants. Yeah, and, and that's what I say. Like this is these aren't impossible to grow in, in, at all. There is I don't think there's an impossible plant out there to grow if you give it the right conditions. And it, sometimes we just can't do that in our home. Yeah. You know, so like the African mass plants, see them on people's Instagram accounts and it looks like they've been grown in their house for a while. It's in with the other plants. But it just really needs very high humidity, and it doesn't want to be dried out. And for me at my house, when you have this many plants, if it's a fussy plant, it's going to give me some trouble, and it, I, I just quit trying. Yeah. And, and I love croton. My grandma actually had one in her house, and it seems like it, it did pretty well. But uh, most people start with those outside because now they use them as thrillers and fillers. and Yes. That's all colorful, and a lot of times you'll see them in the fall because they're fall colors. But once you bring it in the house, it's not, a lot of times it's not, those colors anymore. It just kind of turns a green and some lighter colors because we don't have the intense sun it needs to stay the colors that you want it to stay. And if you forget to water it, it quite often drops all the leaves. <laughs> so it's just a little bit fussy. 
the one that you mentioned that I know people are exposed to this time of year, it's the holidays, you and I are talking, and I see it everywhere, and that is the frosty fern. Oh. They're tough. They're tough. They, I mean, to me, they're, it's, that's a terrarium plant. If you put it in a terrarium and with some bright light, it's probably going to do okay. But just trying to keep it without being having a really humid atmosphere. And here, as you know, in, in the north, our furnaces aren't turning off pretty much. <laughs> so they're just right. We have, what, maybe 20% humidity in our home? Yeah. This one was like about 95% humidity. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so it, and if you can grow it in a terrarium, good for you. And you, I'm not even going to tell you how many. I love heart-shaped anything. My wedding ring is heart-shaped diamond. I have, I have another one again right now. I just bought another one a couple weeks ago. I am going to make that heart fern grow, and I love it, but I, I kill it on a regular basis, and oh, it doesn't take fern. too long for me to kill it. Yeah, no, I'm with you there. Another one, I, it's people consider it a houseplant. Now, I guess they sell it as a houseplant, are those rosemary topiaries. Oh, forget it. I I just <laughs> I walk by and laugh and say, yes, they're gorgeous here, but I mean, I don't think I can get it to last a week in my house. I did have a rosemary, like a, a, a round one that I had gotten many years ago. I had it on my kitchen table, which is a west window, because it was right there in a, in, a, in a prominent place. And then I moved it into the dining room, I think must be for Christmas or something. And it was gone immediately. <laughs> so I used to do a flower show for our garden club. And I would be in charge of setting up the house plants to be judged. There was this one lady every year would bring in this big old rosemary. And she's like, oh, I have it outside all summer. And then I put it in front of my sliding windows all winter. And it just does lovely for me. And I'm like, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know you. Yeah. Who are you? And what color is your thumb? All your hands. Your hands are green. You know, I don't oh, know. Gosh. So it, it, it really is. I, like I said, a lot of people, I see a lot of strings of pearls on Pinterest, on Facebook. And yeah. I know those people, I can leave them outside all year round, and they're, they go clear to the ground, and they're full, and they're beautiful. But in the house, I have two in a south window, and they started out, you know, like in maybe a two- or three-inch pot. I think they're still in those pots, and they're down to about, you know, like 20 pearls each or something. So <laughs> I don't think that's the easiest plant to grow either, No, in my opinion. Yeah, I think that's so. a tough one, in, in our climate especially. Yeah. Yeah. I always use the analogy of Florida because... You know, in Minnesota, people are always looking for wonderful, warm places to go. Florida is usually on the list. But I right. always say, have you ever gone to Florida and then the weather doesn't cooperate? You you go to Florida and the whole week you're there, it's raining, it's overcast. I'm like, that's what it's like for your houseplants. Yes, you're bringing them in. Yes, they're, you know, they're not exposed to the winter, but it's not the same as being in their regular environment. Oh, yeah. And I tell people... I think it's humidity when it comes to those tropical plants. I mean, they're in the our homes, and when you talk about humidity, everybody's like, well, I, I missed my, you know, I missed my plants. Okay, if if you want to do that and it makes you feel good and you're you feel like you're you know misting the plants, but as a rule, that that lasts for about a minute. Yeah, you know, misting them, if that, and you're you, then you're setting, you know, if they sit, the droplets sit on the plant too long and it's a little bit humid around them, and you you know you could set yourself up for getting some leaf disease. It to me it. The pebble tray is the way to go. Yeah. You get that, that saucer, you fill it with pebbles, you fill it with water, and you set your plant on top of, not in the water, on top of the pebbles, and that water is just evaporating all the time around, right around your plant, and the humidity is rising. Plus, you group your plants together, which is not a problem here at my house. So, you know, group them together, and then that raises the humidity as well. And what do you like to use for your trays, Lisa? Do you use like jelly roll pans? I've talked to people who use all kinds of crazy things for pebble trays. Oh, yeah. Well, some of those trays, like those big clay saucers, they're expensive. And then sometimes I I bought a pot that doesn't have a saucer, so I have to get a clay one. It kind of covers up some of the pot that I bought because it's green or orange or whatever. I am a big proponent of going, you know, I go to tag sales, garage sales, Salvation Army, you know, thrift store, whatever. And I get like ashtrays. No one uses those anymore, so yeah. <laughs> they are yeah. at the antique stores and everything. And they're they're glass, so they're see through. They're not going to crack. Sometimes your clay thing cracks and you don't know it, and then you have water everywhere. So I use those as the trays, and I get pretty big glass like pie pans, quiche bowls, things like that. I and love so that. Just, yeah, something different. Pie pans. Mm-hmm. Those are pretty cheap, and that's a big saucer. Yeah, and I like your idea about the quiche one, too, because then you've got that beautiful ripple around the edge. Yeah, I love it. But if I want a big pebble tray, I'll probably just get a big plastic saucer, and I fill it with pebbles, and then I set my plant on top of it. Hmm. Whatever you use is fine. It makes a big difference. Obviously, make sure it's bigger. 
you know, if you have a four inch pot with a four inch saucer, make sure the, the saucer with the pebbles in it is maybe like even a six or eight or 10 inch to really let that humidity get up around your plants. Well, let's talk really quick because by the time this airs, the holidays will be behind us and we may find ourselves the proud owner of a Norfolk pine or <laughs> some other yeah. holiday plant and wanting to keep that going What tips do you have for some of the more popular things that people might all of a sudden be the proud owners of? I love poinsettias. I used to, they used to not be my favorite thing. I don't know why, but now I'm just like, I decorate with them. But it's gone through the holidays. It's starting to look bad. It dries up. The leaves drop. If you cut that back at about six inches and then just let it come back, it will come back. And even if it never flowers and colors up, the bracts never change colors again, it is a beautiful house plant, and a lot of people don't think about it that way. It's got those kind of, a lot of times, sometimes it's like an oak-shaped leaf or a holly-shaped leaf. It's a pretty shaped leaf, and they have red stamens, red yep. petioles. Yep. They're, they're beautiful house plants if you just let it go. And, and even if it never turns red again or white or whatever color it's going to turn, it's still a beautiful house plant. Exactly. Because I think trying to get it to turn again may be a little bit of a challenge. The Norfolk Valentine, I've had mine. Or, well, my brother had it. It was for my grandma's funeral, and I still have it. It's in the book. And it's, it's kind of in an east window, and it, I water it, make sure it doesn't want to dry out because it will drop its bottom branches. I've done this. And it's on a pebble tray because they do not like to be dried out. They like to be humid, so I have it on a pebble tray. And it does fine. I treat it just like a house plant. Your cyclamen, a lot of people are like, well, it died down, and I threw it away. You know, it died. I killed it. But you probably didn't kill it. They go dormant for the summer. So if it dies down... I had a friend who just left hers in her north bay window, so it got some east and west sun, and it just it would die down and come back and flower and die down and come back and flower, and she never moved it. Hmm. That's and fantastic. don't water those in the middle because there's a tuber. So if you water it in the middle, there's a little indentation in that tuber, and it will rot it. Oh, so always sure. water around the edges oh, okay. of, a, of a cyclamen. That's a good They don't like a lot of heat. They would rather be in a cooler room. So if you have it next to the furnace, you know, the heat vent, and it, you keep your house at 75, or 70, you know, it's probably not going to do as well as someone who keeps their house a little bit cooler. Yep. But a beautiful plant. And, of course, Christmas and Thanksgiving cactus, my, one of my absolute favorite plants on the earth. I, mine just sit in the window. I turn them. Make sure you turn them. If you keep one all year round, make sure you turn it because it will only bloom on the side that it got the most light if you don't, never turn it. My daughter found that out. She goes, Mom, my Christmas cactus is only blooming on one side. I go, did you turn it when you watered it all year? And she's like, no, that's why. So always Good turn tip. it. Once it gets its bloom buds, though, then it's better just to leave it because you don't want to turn it okay. at that point. But okay. beautiful plants. You know, Christmas cactus or Thanksgiving cactus, whichever one you have, they are a Brazilian jungle plant. They grow in trees. They're epiphytes in the jungles of Brazil. So it likes high humidity. You aren't going to treat it like you treat your other cacti and succulents. It likes a lot of humidity. So definitely take that one to the sink or when you water it and kind of spray it. And then um, don't let don't it doesn't really want to dry out as it can dry out some because it is a, it is a cactus, but it would rather be have you know stay even kind of evenly moist. All right. You know you can you can take segments of them, take them off, let them callus over, and then start new plants. You know then put them in potting medium, and they'll grow new plants. But it's also just good to give them when you at the, when they're done blooming in the spring, kind of give them a light shearing. You know because everywhere there was just one stem that one flower would come out of, now you're going to have, if you cut it off, you're going to have two, you're going to grow two stems. Next year you'll have two flowers where you had one flower before. So if you give them a light shearing, it's going to make it more, have more flowers next year. Love that. Well, lots of great tips today, Lisa. We had a wonderful conversation here, lots of practical, good advice. How can people get a hold of you? How can they find you online? Where do you like to hang out? My website is thehouseplantguru.com. You can ask me questions or send me pictures if you have a question on Facebook at The Houseplant Guru. And I'm on Instagram and I'm on Twitter. I love all those. I'm on them way too much. <laughs> yeah. Well, aren't we all? And I have to yeah. ask before I let you go, do you have a houseplant that's on your wish list? Something that you'd love to get? Oh, boy. You, if you could, if you, I'm looking around. I have so many plants. <laughs> It's whatever, whatever I see that I don't have, it's on my wish list. Of course, of course. <laughs> but I can't think of anything, you know, right off the top of my head, right this minute that I, 
would die for. But I wouldn't turn away any plants that anybody gave me. Yeah, you and me both. I could definitely talk houseplants all day. Thank you very much. I had such a good time. Well, that's Someone great. Someone actually wants to talk to me about houseplants. I, it's <laughs> wonderful. I love it too. Well, your book is called Houseplants, The Complete Guide to Choosing, Growing, and Caring for Indoor Plants. Lisa Eldred Steinkopf, thank you so much for being on the show today. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank yep. you for thinking of me and, and doing this. I'm honored, really. All right. Well, this was so fun. Thanks, Lisa. Have a great day. You too. All right. Bye-bye. All right. Bye. Well, that's it for our show today featuring Lisa Eldred Steinkopf, a.k.a. the Houseplant Guru, and her new book, Houseplants, The Complete Guide to Choosing, Growing, and Caring for Indoor Plants. I want to thank Lisa for going through especially that list of easy-to-grow plants. And I hope today's show helped you hone in on that category because that's really where you want to be. The odds are good. You'll have the best investment of your time and money with those plants, and they will give you the most personal satisfaction. Just a reminder that the show notes for this episode will be under the Still Growing Podcast page on my website over at sixfootmama.com. That's the number six, F-T, mamma.com. I'm so thankful to my team over at Podfly Productions, my editor and project manager, Eric Begay, and my copywriter, Ein Kadena. I'd also like to thank the women that make up my listener advisory board, Beth Engel, Beth Gardens in Illinois. She works at Griffin, a national brokerage firm, and one of the finest companies in horticultural service. And Beth is also a board member of the PPA, the Perennial Plant Association. Denise Pugh, Denise Gardens in North Mississippi, and is a contributing writer to Mississippi Gardener Magazine. Amy Von Atchen, Patricia Chandler Newport. Patricia is the owner of Backyard Urban Gardens out of Kego Harbor, Michigan. Deb Gibson and Peggy Ann Montgomery. Peggy Ann is the brand manager over at American Beauty's Native Plants, and she was featured back in episode 553, where we talked all about incorporating more native plants into your garden. That would be a great goal for 2018. For my sign-off today, I leave you with this thought to help you grow. Take inspiration from Lisa Eldred Steinkopf and start a nice-sized pebble tray. Group those houseplants together, and for heaven's sake, add some light if you need to. Have a great week, everyone. Still Growing with Jennifer Ebling is a SixFootMama.com production made in lovely Maple Grove, Minnesota. Still Growing is a weekly gardening podcast dedicated to helping you and your garden grow. 